a new face among us. So welcome, Rick. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I don't know if you want to share a little bit of background so you get so the other board members, which I know Mike mentioned that he Sure, I'll keep it really short. Okay. Um, this will be my second tour of the uh, <clears throat> health, health uh, department uh, board. I was on it a number of years ago as a community representative and have not been on it since I was been on the um, county commission. I've been on the county commission now for about five years. It's just been my first tour as a county commissioner. Um, I remember retired uh, CPA from Ide Bailey. Uh, during that time, I was also on the Fargo School Board for 12 years, and now on the county commission for five, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Right. And then I think the only person you haven't met is probably Lynn. I'm Lynn Telford, and I'm a community representative. I'm a nurse at Sanford as well. And I've been on the board for over a year. So welcome, Rick. Welcome. All right. OK, so we're going to defer the, the meeting minutes because Lynn and I were the only ones that, are, that were present last time. So we wouldn't have enough or, uh, people to approve those. So we're going to defer those to the next meeting. But other announcements, Desi? Um, just a couple of things. So we have the um, holiday tea. That's kind of an annual event at our building that our WIC folks put on that you are all invited to attend, which is December 18th from 1.30 to 3. So it's really just a time to uh, <coughs> visit and to have some holiday treats. And then you can also see our great decorating skills that we have we have a pretty heavy com competition in our building on door decorating for the holidays. So um, that is our final judging day there as well. So we'd love to have you come if you're available. Um, also, uh, Dr. Anderson, who couldn't be here today, he worked in overnight and has sick kids, but his term for our Board of Health expires the end of this month. So he will not be um, seeking another term just due to time conflicts and everything, but he had sent an email so I just wanted to share that because he had some thank yous so um, he wanted to thank Mayor Mahoney for the appointment thank you to chairperson matter for her leadership I was honored to serve with excellent leaders including Dinah Goldberg and the late Commissioner Vern Bennett it's been a pleasure to serve along with Commissioner Strand and Mike Thorstead amongst others I'm proud of the department's work including implementation of harm reduction strategies the work has reduced opioid related deaths and morbidity in our community I'm proud of ensuring adequate staffing for jail nursing. The mobile outreach program has freed up police, paramedic, and emergency room resources, saving the community thousands of dollars. These are just a few of the things that I'm happy to say that I've been involved with in a very small way. Thank you to all the hardworking staff who make these programs tick. So awesome. he will be very much missed. So Yes, very much so. Please send him our best wishes. Yeah, and other than that, we just um, we do have Jennifer Breedall here from Vitalent, which is formerly known as United Blood Services, and she just wanted to give an update on kind of the status of things in our community. Thank you for having me. Um, I did want to come and speak with you. I am Jennifer Breedall, the Community Ambassador Director for Vitalent Blood Centers, uh, formerly known as United Blood Services. I'm still getting used to that new name, so. Um, but my goal is to come out and, and speak with you a little bit about our needs in our community. Uh, we have some holidays coming up and different things that are very concerning as far as the blood supply in our community. Um, Vitalent is uh, the sole provider of blood and blood products for Sanford and Essentia and all hospitals in this region, um, 72 different hospitals to be exact. And um, so if anybody needs blood in your family, uh, that's where it's gonna come from. And so our goal is to get more donations. We're really struggling with that right now. Um, and so I'm asking to come to the city and, and talk a little bit more about our needs and find different partnerships that may be out there. Um, we have about 250 donations a day that we need to come up with as far as getting people to walk through the door. And it's becoming very much of a task for all of us to make that happen. Um, with the holidays coming up, our organization is a nationwide organization throughout the country. Um, but our goal is to always take care of our local needs first. And if those needs are met, we are able to help other locations across the country. And that's kind of standard for this type of a business. 
Um, with the holidays coming up, I, I've been with our organization for almost 16 years, and I've never seen kind of the panic that's happening right now within um, each area across the country, worried about taking care of their own, much less helping out others. And so I don't want us to get in a situation where we haven't had our community step up as much as we need them to, to take care of our local needs. Um, when the holidays happen, everybody gets busy and we're not able to maybe step up and donate at our business blood drives or school blood drives as much. And winter weather is causing a lot of issues in small communities, that type of thing, getting out there to do blood drives, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm asking to um, have you be the voice as well to our community and that important need to step up and donate and lead by example. Um, and also, I'd like to leave my card here when I leave. And if you have any ideas on partnerships that we can do with different organizations, um, we're kind of trying to pull out all stops right now. We've even got something where we're partnering with all nonprofits that want to work with us, and we're able to give back to their organization $10 per donation um, that they send in. So we're really trying to become that partnership within our community, not just the, the community blood center where we're asking for things. We're now giving back to organizations that can help us as well. And that's been going very, very well, but we can always use more partnerships where we have them come in and do blood drives with us and that type of thing and give back financially. So there's all kinds of ideas, but I just need support because I'm one person trying to get this message out there. They've recently created this position in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, it's not anywhere else in the country with our organization. We're piloting my position um, to try to help move the needle on donations and see if we can make a difference by doing things like this. So uh, again, just asking for your support and I will be happy to leave my information here and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take phone calls or emails or answer them now. Does anybody have any questions for, for Jennifer? Can we help in any way by making a public statement? You know, through the media that that we are in need of blood donations in our community. I don't know. Yeah, is there? I mean, can we? I don't know if you would typically do some type of media release or anything in support of their message or what media efforts you have currently going that we can share on like the public health. We have, media. you know, on our social media stuff, we could okay. certainly do some things with that. Repost. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, if you can work with Holly back there, she would, that would yeah. be a good fit. We can get some talking points together that are easily shared through social media and that type of thing as well. So thank you for that. It is, it's also National um, Blood Donation Month in January, and we'd love to have people in the community talk about how important it is to donate blood and do just a short little video that's informal, but just talking about the, the need. And so if anybody's willing to just speak up as, as a nurse would be great, or you know anybody with the different roles in our community saying thank you to those that are stepping up because it's amazing when I pull up to the blood center and I see all the cars that are in the parking lot and they're all just doing it out of their own good. They're not gonna get a reward or anything from the, the person they're giving it to, but they're um, really just rolling up their sleeve and doing the right thing. So I think it's a great way to say thank you. Um, so if you're willing to do that, please let me know, I'll leave my cards. Thank you, I might be a little biased uh, but my daughter works with uh, Vitalant and Jennifer, and she's been there nine years as a donor recruitment rep. Oh, and yes. Jenna, and uh, yes, I knew I knew you. <laughs> I'm like, how do I know you? And I, I think I've given like 130 or 140 times, and it's really easy to get out there and give blood, and it doesn't take up much time, and it's uh, vitally important uh, to the community. So I really encourage everybody who can, and anybody who watches the video, to get out there and give blood. Jennifer, um, my name is Larry Annans, and I'm the director of our clinic. And I guess my question is, uh, what is the process in somebody wanting to donate blood? Um, do they call in, schedule an appointment, go online, walk in? Just how easy is it for somebody who might be thinking about donating blood? It's a great question. Um, there's a couple different options. You can go online to bloodhero.com and register that way. You type in your zip code and it'll tell you all the blood drives around the community that you can attend or our fixed site location in South Fargo. Um, you can also call us um, at Vitalant and schedule that with us or you can walk in. We've had several walk-ins recently that weren't able to schedule with that crazy holiday season and but walking in is, is definitely a welcome for us as well. 
Um, we do have a lot of different blood drives around the community when you see the blood mobiles and different things like that. It's a community support that you're always welcome to attend any of those blood drives. So don't think if you see it at a school that it's only for the people that work at that school or go to that school. Um, if it's convenient for you, that's why we're out there is trying to make it convenient for people. So we welcome that. And the process to donate is very, very simple. You come in, as long as you're 16 years or older, um, in feeling in good health, we will do the mini physical um, for you. And that's one of the benefits of donating blood is you're getting a mini physical for free with us. And um, the questionnaire takes about 10, 15 minutes. Actually, you can do that online now too. So you can save some time on your appointment that way. Um, the blood draw itself takes about seven to eight minutes. And then you have some snacks on the way out the door and it's a pretty quick and simple process. Outstanding, thank you. Thank you. Jennifer for coming in and letting us know about the the need in this community especially around this time of the year we certainly appreciate you providing that information we'll do what we can um, repost on social media or what have you to raise additional awareness so thank you wonderful thank you so did you have one other you talk about the Board of Health member term limit, or was that, that was related like, to? Yeah, that was Dr. Anderson. Anderson. Okay. Unless we want to talk just briefly about the bylaws that we're. Sure. We will be updating um, minor updates to the bylaws, which I think will come out to you guys as a draft version. And then at the next meeting, then we, you guys can formally vote on those to accept changes. All right. Sounds good. Melissa, budget? I didn't. I don't have the November numbers ready. I just got them and uh, just looked at them briefly. But I uh, just want to let you know uh, where we're at. Um, bottom line for revenue, we are at 80% this year. Last year, same time period, we were at 84%. Um, expenses right now we're at 86% of the budget, and last year we were at 89%. So both just down slightly from where we were last year at the same time. Um, I expect them both to come relatively close to 100% in both areas. And I'll send out the numbers, I'll just send them to the board as soon as I have November's done. So if you have any questions, you can let me know. You can email me back. Nothing, nothing else to really report on the budget though. Sounds like it's in line. So any yep. other questions? Okay, we'll look forward to the November numbers then. Okay. All right, statistics. Yeah, so there is um, several of the managers are here as well. So if there's any specific questions that you guys have noticed as you're going through any of the statistics, just a couple of things to point out um, are the jail statistics aren't included as they didn't get done in time. Heidi is on leave, and so that didn't quite get done for our deadline here. So you, uh, we will get those to you as soon as we can. Um, in our harm reduction services, just we had talked about getting the electronic um, reporting system, which will be starting hopefully within the next few months. So hopefully our data that we can get through those programs is going to be much cleaner. Um, I think right now sometimes categories are kind of vague, and so I, I think that will help to kind of um, firm up some of our data and kind of the efforts and um, money we're saving in that program as well. Um, you can see, obviously, from the syringe services program that that um, has greatly blossomed um, with Narcan, with overdose reversals, with participants, all of that's been really positive. Mobile outreach, all of those things um, have made a huge difference. So any other questions you have, you can let me know and we can to address them. Questions on any of the statistics at all? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Environmental health. All right. 
right, I'll press. I think you can hear me, right? So, uh, good afternoon, board members. My name is Grant Larson, Director of Environmental Health at FireOcast Public Health. I'll just go back real quickly. The programs, what I intend to do is just try to give a quick year-end review for what our division is doing. And they go along with our statistics, which you just, you, you have embedded there in your information. Uh, just going back briefly, I'm just, uh, Desi and I have talked about our statistics and our goal this year for those is to kind of consolidate and make it kind of a little bit more efficient to capture our data so then next year it's going to be presented in a different way. We have to work with our vendor, a digital electronic vendor that captures our information. So going forward, I think it'll be a little bit more clear and I'll point that out uh, as we revise that in the future. Um, as you can see, I, I won't read verbatim here, but uh, our, our division's been busy this year. Uh, the aquatic program, um, we started a couple years ago to provide annual education seminars within the health department for our uh, pool operators and uh, licensed owners. And uh, that's been successful. It's not mandatory, but it's good information so that they can comply with the requirements that we have set forth in the ordinance and our, our pool requirements on a local basis for Fargo and West Fargo is where we um, enforce those and license those pool requirements. Uh, part of this, uh, the next uh, part of the aquatic thing, I'll let Hunter, I'm not going to steal his thunder, he's going to talk about a Legionella outbreak uh, that was associated, that we responded to within our division this year. Uh, moving down to body art, uh, we, we revised and implemented a new bloodborne pathogen training for all of our body art operators. Since they deal directly with blood, we wanted to make sure that they were aware of the ramifications and uh, sensitivity that they should uh, be aware of and cognizant of if uh, they're dealing with soiled blood and the transmission of blood from operator to uh, the customer or vice versa. So we have, now we have made that uh, a requirement for annual education for them to fulfill their licensure per year. Childcare program, um, I just want to make you aware that uh, actually the childcare program will cease to exist in the environmental division because of, uh, oh, sure, oh sorry. Uh, much better, right? Uh, but uh, based on um, legal guidance from the Department of Human Services, talking to the State uh, Department of Health, specific food and lodging, uh, there was a ruling made that um, the environmental health should stay in their lane as far as doing food service only. So essentially what we're going to have is three lanes. We're going to have social services doing the sanitation and their licensure for the child care centers. We'll still license a center if they provide food or food services in that center. So we'll license and inspect as such. And then health promotion that Larry's over within Firecast Public Health will also run concurrently. They'll do the healthcare activity, which is your amount of juice and screen time and physical activity. So you have three different sets of lanes there and that's kind of what the division is. So, so we're gonna pull back an ordinance as far as environmental health. We're still gonna be in these centers, but it's gonna be more specifically for food uh, which leads into the next program we have, the food program, which is our biggest program. Um, and so we continue to do a lot of work in education in the, in the restaurants within Fargo and West Fargo for that program. Other things we've uh, implemented, I've, uh, I've taken over the lead for a mobile food pilot program within the city of Fargo. I presented this to our city of Fargo commission. Um, there's a need for our vendors and our mobile food vendors to have access and be able to serve populations that are needed within our community or have an opportunity. And uh, our commission and mayor see, see that uh, as an opportunity. So what we're trying to do is get the best fit for everybody involved. And actually yesterday, part of it now is uh, do a collabor collaboration with uh, the mobile food vendors. And I brought them in yesterday to get their feedback to what works, what their concerns are and stuff like that to move forward. So we're getting pieces of the puzzle what I'll present here after the first of the year to the commission as far as a recommendation for the size of Fargo. You know, we're not Denver, we're not Washington, D.C. They have mobile food units go around the community and serve that doesn't work for the operators or us as a, as a division. So there'll be more to come on that. We've also enro enrolled in the FDA food retail food program standards. So essentially what that does, it gives us uh, more money to grant money for specific food education. And it's, since it is our biggest program, we welcome that additional funding for it training uh, not only our staff, but then the, the people that we work with out in the field. Lodging, which would be our hotels, motels. We just make sure that uh, 
they have a li licensed pest control company uh, on retainer uh, because we do not check for pests, whether it's bed bugs or mice. We we uh, have them make sure to get a third party to make sure that they're the expertise in their industry, and then they provide a copy of a written receipt to us if they have problems or issues. We turn to the licensed pest control company. Mobile home parks. We've been we took this over from the state about four years ago. The state health department used to do this. Uh, City of Fargo specifically saw that we had a little bit more need to collaborate, so we do inspections in tandem with the building inspections, the fire inspection ourselves, and PD if, if needed to, to uh, enforce the requirements within mobile home parks. Right now we see there's some gaps or need for more teeth in our requirements, so we're looking at uh, bolstering the regulations and ordinance with our legal team within the City of Fargo. Nuisance complaints is very busy. I'm just highlighting today up on the slide grass complaints, which our division runs continuously from May through November. So this year we had 910 individual grass complaints. Um, of those, we sent 143 to the contract mowers. But if you look at 110, that means for every one of those we get, we have to go out to that property and go, yes, it's in compliance or out of compliance. Come back and then put it in the system and write it off or continue it. So it's a, it's a lengthy process and we have seasonal employees that help us with that. But uh, the other thing on the end of that to highlight is it's a record we build out almost $35,000 for build service to include our administration fees, which is only $15 or $50 uh, per contract mower event. And we have outstanding of you know over 15.5 due to date. So I wanted to point that out. On-site sewage treatment systems, that's obviously not within the corporate limits of Fargo and West Fargo, that's outside in our counties and the six counties in the southeast. To some extent where we um, we implement the, and we license and regulate on-site sewage treatment systems to a certain point. Um, right now, I just want to highlight that a Senate Bill 2241 has implemented a public hearing and study because there's a, there's a need, there's an inconsistency, inconsistency across the state. I'll put it that, because unlike Minnesota has one rule that blankets the state, that tells the exact how to license and inspect. Right now, North Dakota goes county by county, which you can see how painfully political that process would get. So what we're hoping that out of that uh, public hearing and study comes the need for a uniform code through the Division of Environmental Quality. And they've already earmarked to try to get two FE, FTEs in the next uh, legislative session, which would greatly bolster this program and uh, put a lot of angst to bed and uh, help us as far as consistent uh, licensing and regulation of that, that, that program. Pet store program, um, we identified gaps there because that's one of these things where the boarding kennels that you bring your dogs and cats to are licensed through the, specifically through the city of Fargo, but they don't get followed up on unless there's a complaint. So this summer we had a complaint on one of the kennels and they called us and we said, we don't do anything with that. So the police department's supposed to follow up on doing those complaints. Well, that's not their area expertise. And since we have a pet store program Currently, where they sell pets, we said we're working now with the legal team as well as in, you know, internally to say, you know, why don't we take this on board and, and start being uh, propose something to the city commission to say, why don't we be a little bit more proactive and go in there and check for cleanliness and, and you know different items in there. So that's uh, ongoing. We have a meeting next week to try to get a proposal. Uh, no updates on the tanning, and then uh, the North Dakota Southeast Collaborative. I think maybe you're aware of, but. That's the six south, southeast counties in North Dakota that we do some outreach uh, services to some degree, uh, including uh, aquatic or pools and then uh, on-site septic systems and some nuisances, hit and, hit and miss as far as blighted buildings and such. So um, that's kind of what I want to highlight for our year in review, but if you have any questions about any one of these programs, I'd be happy to address them at this time. Sure. Appreciate your time, right. support from the board. We, we appreciate that. And uh, I'll turn over to Hunter so we can get a little bit into the aquatic program at our Legionella case. Thanks, Grant. That was pretty comprehensive. I appreciate that update. Yeah. Hi, my name's Hunter Kubrig, and I'm under Grant in Environmental Health with Fargo Cass Public Health. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick, broad overview of our Legionella um, investigations we've done over the course of the last year. Um, so just to start, the North Dakota Department of Health Disease Control takes the main lead on Legionella investiga disease investigations, and we go in and help assist um, within Fargo Cass Public Health. So, I just 
Okay, so just quick to start, uh, what is Legionella? It's a water, waterborne disease that we can get just through inhalation of the water moisture, water droplets. You can't get it from drinking water unless you aspirate. Um, and most times it, it shows up as pneumonia-like symptoms, and it has a fatality rate of 10%. This is just quick showing the, the trend in North Dakota for Legionella. In North Dakota with the population, it's kind of tough to find any trends, but nationally, I think from 2000 to 2015, we've seen a 350% increase in Legionella um, reportable cases. And so we ask why, why the increase? Basically, there's just more testing, more surveillance. We used to go into, somebody would come in, they'd get pneumonia, it's done. They treat it as pneumonia. There's, now they're doing more testing, we're trying to see what it actually is, they're getting more into the weeds. Um, so now we're actually seeing it more coming up. So like I said, the North Dakota Department of Health takes the lead on any disease investigation. Um, when they get a clinical uh, Legionella case, they look into the travel information, possible water exposures, healthcare exposures, clinical data, and at that point, that's when we get notified as environmental health at the public health level. And just a reason why we get notified is because we're, we're required as our job to be nationally credentialed to have a knowledge of the water systems, the building water systems. Um, we're required that for our job as environmental health professionals. So they ask us to call, go in and actually out of the three parts of a disease investigation, we help with the environmental assessment and the sampling of any facility. So when we're going in, what we're looking for is we're looking for, we got identif we identified a facility that's a most likely cause. We're trying to identify where did this grow in the system so we can kind of isolate the area in the building on where we're finding Legionella. Uh, we do provide recommendations on the necessary steps to prevent the biofilm development. That's where the Legionella is growing in the piping system. But we're not giving that recommendation. We go, we'll give them a recommendation. We're not saying this is how you have to do that. They have to go through their consultant. And then we do provide guidance regarding a water management plan. How do you reduce Legionella going forward? So these are some of the things that we're looking at when we do an environmental assessment on a building. We're looking at what are the temperatures of the water. Legionella likes to grow in certain water temperatures. Are they using the proper disinfectant? Is there biofilm growing in the pipes? It, has there been construction going on with a lots of pressure that can loosen up biofilm, getting it into the water system? Um, are there dead legs in the system and how some of their water features are designed that might help Legionella proliferate, proliferate. So these are just some obvious signs that we're looking at. I, anyone can, you might even have this in your house, you know, growth shower. Um, these are something that we're looking at, obvious signs of biofilm. So this is, the, I, I kind of just put some pictures on there because you need a, what's the visual? What are we looking for? Um, but in reality, we are going in a lot of times there's zero signs that there's any type of Legionella present. So once we do the assessment, when we meet with the facility team, the, whether it be director of nursing, the doctors, it could just be a maintenance guy, um, we go in, come up with a sample plan, we figure out all the samples we need, the equipment we need, um, we work with the Department of Health to send it into the state lab, and we do the sampling wearing the proper PPE and uh, kind of developing that relationship with the facility so we can keep coming in on a regular basis doing testing. This is just a quick show hand of the, the sample collection that we're using, it's a nice little picture. Um, but there, we go off the CDC recommendations and guidance on the proper way to sample so no facility can come back and say you guys aren't doing it right. We go everything off the CDC recommendations um, and sampling guidance. These are just a few pictures of the facility we did actually go into, um, some of the features that we had to take samples from, swabbing some of the kids' play features, finding biofilm, taking sand samples, that those are actually spa sand filters. And this is actually um, our environmental team climbing cooling water towers on buildings, trying to get samples from the cooling water and the proper sample sites. And so once we identify, yep, we, we have a positive Legionella sample, um, we go through and find a remediation plan. We, we ask them to talk to their consultants, they do a remediation, and then we set up a sampling schedule to make sure that the remediation's working. Um, we have 
one sample every two to two weeks for three months, and then after that comes back negative, it's one sample a month for three months. Anytime it comes back positive, we restart the sampling schedule all over again. And we came up with this schedule, um, the North Dakota Department of Health Disease Control with us, and then we actually consulted with the CDC out of Atlanta, and they said, yep, this is a good practice, um, so it's nationally recognized, this type of remediation schedule. And finally, I like to throw this on there, just we always get asked, well, what temperatures do they grow in? And it's basically 95 to 115 degrees, that's their optimal growth, so that's why we put a huge emphasis on our spa features, hot tubs, um, anywhere those features where you have that type of water. Um, and one issue too with this is we use for remediation, one way to use is high heat, well then we get into scalding issues, especially in let's say hospitals long term care. So then it's trying to find that proper solution with do we use disinfectant, do we use high heat, trying to find that with the, con the consultation. Um, and that's kind of a quick broad overview, I didn't get into the weeds of the actual investigation, just how we're involved why we're involved, and how we assist the Department of Health and Disease Control on our Legionella. And I believe over the course of the last year, we've had three investigations. So it's, we'll see if it keeps going up from here, but it's good to get involved and help out the Department of Health on this. Any questions? Sir, any questions? Thank you. And you said three investigations in Cass County? Yes, in Cass County. This past year, okay. Yep, year, yeah, over the last year. So are we seeing an in, Increase. I know you shared the statistics from the state. Is there is so prior to this last year, we have not been in, in part of any investigation. Okay. So I don't know if it's just a pro change of process from the state level, or if it's just truly we're seeing an increase due to surveillance and testing. Any questions? Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Hunter. Okay. All right. So the, the next agenda item that we have is really just a kind of a continuation of the discussion that we had had previously. So we had Melissa and others walk through kind of just vaping and the education around um, kind of that epidemic and what we can do around that. So we had a lot of energy. And so um, I sent out um, two different resolutions um, to the board members and Rick has unfortunately just read it before here since he's new um, to the to this board, but um, hopefully you had a chance to review them. There's two. One is a concerning a raising the age of tobacco use, which would include, hopefully includes, <coughs> make sure that it includes vaping um, to 21. Um, part of that resolution we walk through, um, there's different statements in there, but really the emphasis around that and where, where, where I feel strongly about this is I think it's definitely a proven method to reduce youth initiation um, with smoking. If you're 18, you're still in high school, it's more accessible. Um, there are 19 states that have raised the, the age of tobacco um, to 21 in over 530 communities. I think we're the only non-preemptive preemptive state that hasn't done anything at a city level. Although recently you said Devil's Lake introduced a city ordinance um, but that to raise the age to 21, but that's only for vaping products, um, which I think is um, a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're raising the age on just vaping, then to me that's giving the signal to the community that any other tobacco use is okay from 18 to 21, but just not vaping. So that's the, the first resolution that I put before you all. And then the other piece that I think would help um, just kind of curb this whole vaping epidemic is a flavor um, ban as well. And so supporting legislation or an ordinance or what have you around just getting rid of some of the flavors. So strawberry, mango, whichever um, adults aren't using flavored um, vapes. Um, so it seems like a, something that we should address. I know there's been federal activity around that and that seems to have taken a step back. So I think there's an opportunity here locally to address that as well. So I'm asking for the board support to push forward um, 
both the adopting the resolution around raising the age of tobacco um, from 18 to 21, but also um, supporting any legislation around the flavor ban. But I'd welcome any discussion um, ahead of that just to provide any clarity. I know we haven't had a chance to talk about any of the things that I've sent, so thoughts? I support both. I mean, we, we talked about this at the last meeting, and so I fully support a city ordinance that would increase the tobacco age to 21, and then same with the flavor bans. I was part of previous conversations. I know these two weren't, so they may have more questions. Just as a, a, I've been talking with a lot of folks around just the activity around the state, in particular around um, raising the age from 18 to 21 for tobacco products, and there's some activity. I know Bismarck is looking at it, as well as Jamestown, Valley City, and then we already touched on the Devil's Lake piece. So this is gaining a little bit of momentum. There's a lot of cities on the Minnesota side that have done this already um, so a lot around the Twin Cities and then I think we talked about Otter Tail County and um, some other places throughout the state of Minnesota so I think it's it's gaining traction um, and there is some federal movement on that as well but we I think we have an opportunity here to do something sooner than what we instead of waiting for the federal government to address it so we talked last last meeting too about collaborating with Moorhead mm -hmm. and um, and knowing that their taxes are a lot higher in Moorhead, people already tend to come over here. But again, if we changed the age limit, we'd need to work with Moorhead. Um, and it seems like with them having lower sales due to the high taxes, they shouldn't, mm -hmm. they would possibly be open to that, so. Chelsea, I raised the question about uh, if the first resolution refers to tobacco products. I know a couple of sessions ago, at the state legislature was asked to classify vaping products as tobacco products and they failed to do that and I don't know has that changed in the last couple of years or is the vaping the products are they considered tobacco products under state I see a, a head shake of no so that might be an edit that we need to make to the resolution just to I'm make assuming so it really has to do a lot with the vaping products as well yeah. you want to come up and comment Yes, to answer your question, that has not changed um, as far as vaping products, um, especially when it relates to the tax in our state. Vaping products are not taxed like a tobacco product. So yes, that had it failed to pass a couple sessions ago and the last session as well. So if we're looking for a resolution, do we have to expand the resolution or just assume they wouldn't consider it if they're reluctant to do something with vaping products at this point, or should we change a resolution to specifically include vaping products? I would propose to change the resolution just to make sure that we're addressing the vaping piece because I want to be clear that, I mean, this is part of it. If we move forward with raising the age and then vaping is still allowed 18 to 21, then I don't think we're accomplishing what we're setting out for. Right. Here in part, so what, we, what would have to be done, we'd have to double check on our um, definition. We define tobacco products, and I do believe in city ordinance, in city of Fargo ordinance, we define tobacco products. Uh, as vaping products fall under that definition. So I think we would be covered, but we would have, we would want, they would want to, in drafting some kind of ordinance, would um, want to double check on the definitions, and that can always be uh, updated as well. Melissa, other questions or? This resolution, is the purpose of it, the primary purpose to uh, target, I guess, the legislature? I see problems if you're looking at individual uh, entities. For instance, in the metro area here, let's say Fargo adopts it, but West Fargo doesn't, or Horace doesn't, or Harwood doesn't, Castleton. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it would be ineffective. Ideally, it would be for the state to to take this and regulate it at a state level, so that uh, you know we're not going to have that uh, inequity of. Uh, uh, rules within the metro area, and even if Moorhead doesn't act on it, or if they do, others don't. So, I may, mm -hmm. Mike, that's a really good question. I'm thinking a little bit past this, perhaps, but would it be appropriate if we're considered about Fargo, West Fargo, the outlying communities? And I don't even know the 
ability to, to get this accomplished, but would it make sense to adopt it as a county ordinance? Mm -hmm. A request to the county maybe to take a look at that, if they can draft a county ordinance if we feel strongly about that. I can't guarantee the county commission all feels the same way, but if, you know, if we want something more encompassing, it would make sense to come from the county perspective. I don't know if we can do that, though, legally. But. I think the state would be ideal, but county would be better than municipalities taking up any of it. We did have some discussion about, you know, the chances from a, for a statewide, and I think we, we feel that we'd be running into a fairly large roadblock there. Um, you know, when we did s smoke free efforts, we went city by city um, and that gained momentum and eventually the, the state adopted it. Um, and so while I can uh, certainly appreciate the, um, the challenges that doing it city by city can pose, I think we were at least starting the trend um, and hopefully it would spread beyond that. And I'm not opposed to approaching um, Cass County as, as a whole for this. So my, my purpose for bringing this forward is really to have the board support to move forward with drafting some potential, like a, either a city ordinance or addressing it at the, at the county level and see where it goes from there. But I want support from the board first before I would move that direction. I support the concept of moving to 21 on all items, tobacco and mm -hmm. land being used by this. Okay. Where that falls, you know, I, I'm not sure where that would fall. I think we're very, you know, we get along real well in the, the, the city here and the county, <laughs> but we're still competitive with each other and it's... That's why I sit between that, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that will be a challenge to get everyone to, to, to get in line. It certainly would be easier to come from the mm -hmm. state level and if they... We, and we talked about that too, and um, even just waiting for the next legislative session, and then knowing it's a long time. it is a long time, and then knowing that Fargo does set an example as the biggest city in the state, and there was examples last time about things that Fargo has done, like the smoke-free, that then the state, you know, sometimes we do have to do it first, and so ideal state would obviously be that the state, mm -hmm. you know, take this on, but I think if we don't want to wait two years plus we can make a statement and it's nice to hear that other communities are talking about it too so then it's not just Fargo that's having those conversations Madam Chair <clears throat> so I understand that you're looking for a resolution from the from the uh, health department basically Board of Health that city at this point in time city adopts the ordinance city may want to work in conjunction with other cities in the county but you're really looking at this point that the, the Board of Health makes some type of recommendation or resolution is that correct? That, that's correct, because I, you know, I, from an advocacy standpoint, I know the actual health department has some limitations on how far they can go. So I'm, I'm viewing this as something that I can do on behalf of the Board of Health to approach city commission or county commission to bring this forward and have um, discussion on if we can make this happen um, and set an example for the, for the rest of the state, to your point, Lynn. Well, I'll just move to adopt a resolution with the appropriate language changes if necessary regarding the, this is resolution number one, regarding the definition of tobacco products. Second. A second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you for, for your support on, on Tobacco 21, as they call it. Um, I can work with with others, there's a, a national organization that's been working on um, ordinances across, well, and, and statewide legislation as well. So I'll work with some of those nice folks to see what we can get drafted and then work with the appropriate city or county personnel to make sure that it's appropriate for either the city or the, the county on that piece. Any discussion on the flavor piece? supporting a, a resolution around flavors. I know that's gotten a lot of traction at the federal level, but it's recently President Trump talked about it and then kind of backpedaled on his thoughts around that. That might be a little bit more logistically difficult 
um, to implement. Um, we start getting into, you, do you consider menthol a type of flavor and that type of thing, but really what I'm after with this particular resolution is the strawberry and that type of stuff that um, kids have access to today with vaping products. And maybe, you know, I, we work on 21 first and then see where the flavoring piece goes. I, me personally, I feel a little bit more strongly about the Tobacco 21 than I do about the, the flavor ban, but I think it's still worthy of, a, of an effort, um, so. If, if you do go forward with it, um, you might want to include menthol because that increases the absorption of the vaping liquid and makes it last longer. So that uh, does play a key role in it. That's why they put menthol in a lot of cigarettes and things. So That just presents a bigger public challenge. It does. <laughs> it does. suggestions on that one I think your thought on moving forward with the first one at this point in time was okay. valid and do some additional analysis on these on the second one I, and I didn't get a chance to read I mean I, yep. I zipped through that yep. right before the meeting here but okay. there's a lot of issues in there that that are just bigger than than the county or the city or the okay department. I would just be concerned about that without doing some additional analysis on that okay well why don't we I see your head nodding Maybe we just set that one aside and we can have maybe a little bit further discussion on that one in particular at our next board meeting. And in the meantime, I'll work on the Tobacco 21 and see if we can get some traction on that one. Is that flavoring or, or resolution important if you have the 21 or a resolution if that passed? I mean, what you're trying to do is not attract youth to that mm -hmm. product. Well, if it goes to 21, mm -hmm. you know, I think it'd almost be a moot point at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I, I would, maybe Melissa knows how many people over 21 would actually would be interested in using strawberry products, I don't know. <laughs> but we can maybe look at some of the statistics around that and see if, where that lands. But your point is well taken. Okay, all right. Well, I appreciate your support for Tobacco 21 and keep you all updated on the, the progress related to that. Do we have any public comments? Yep. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Justin Danbury. I am a vape shop owner in the city of Fargo. Um, I, I don't know, can I ask questions? I have a question. Um, have any of you ever been into a vape shop? not okay I don't know where this idea comes from that adults don't like flavors I don't I don't understand my store I'd say majority of the age is going to be above 30 at least a 75% majority is above 30 99% of my sales are flavored products okay. tobacco products taste very bad smokers don't want to use those they want to switch to something that doesn't taste like a cigarette, okay? I'm super nervous. I'm really passionate about this subject. And a flavor ban completely destroys my business, shuts it down. I've got three kids at home. I have four employees at my store. What you guys are talking about doing without even understanding the industry blows me away. You laughed at the thought of somebody, an adult liking strawberry. You know how offensive that is? Why wouldn't an adult like strawberry? I use a product right here. See it? Blue Raspberry Slushy Menthol is the product I use, okay? We know Public Health England, the Royal College of Physicians, have all publicly stated, published a study that said that these products are at least 95% less harmful than cigarettes. And you wanna completely eliminate that from the smoker, you're gonna see a rise in smoking, shops, are gonna close down, people are gonna to go to Moorhead to get it. I've got a store in Fergus Falls. Now, they passed T21 in Otter Tail. Fully support that, absolutely 100%. If we can change the age to 21, I think that helps eliminate quite a bit of straw purchasing. I believe that the, the two most common ways that youth are getting these products are straw purchases and online. 
Now, I don't know what the city could do with online sales. I don't know if the state can even do anything with that as far as e-commerce laws and whatnot, but I think raising the age to T21 is a smart thing to do. And that's coming from a store owner. I make my living off selling these products. No store owner, no person that uses these products is gonna tell you that they want teens using, okay? There are companies out there that most shop owners like me, small business guys, absolutely hate. One of the products is Juul. We cannot stand that company. I don't carry their products. Most of the shops that I know don't carry products like that because they intentionally marketed to children. It's not what I am, it's not what I support. But there are, I'd say 95% of this industry is small business people. And different than big tobacco, all the people who started businesses in this industry use these products as opposed to big tobacco execs. None of those guys are smoking. So I think that if you would be willing to just take a look at some things and really, really think about the ramifications coming from a flavor ban and eliminating a product, I see it every day, <laughs> every day in my store. These are adults switching off of cigarettes to vaping. Even if it's only 50% less harmful, that's huge. Flavors do that. Nobody comes in and wants to vape a tobacco flavor. They're disgusting. And so, but, and I, I'm glad you commented on that, and I hope you realize, at least recognize what the, the board did today was absolutely, we're in the same corner as you are, eliminate the 21 and put everything on the, on the flavoring on hold. That's what we did today. I, I understand that, but I just, there's some things being said and I don't know where they come from. I don't know where these studies come from that say adults don't choose flavors and they're just there to entice children. That's not according to my store in Fargo and my store in Fergus, not according to friends of mine's stores all across the country. This, the statistics are, I don't know where they're coming up with this crap. I don't, because it's not the case at all. Well, and I, I certainly appreciate you bringing forward your comments as well, and I, we didn't mean to be offensive in, in any way, shape, or form. I think a lot of the, the studies that have been brought forward are, you know, CDC and, and peer-reviewed journals that are saying this, but you have real-life experience that you're bringing yeah, to the I'd table. Yeah, and I'd like to know where they're getting their information from. I feel like they're lying. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where they're getting it from. So I, as I'm not talking to vape shop owners, I can tell you that much. Perfect. Thank you for yeah. your comments. I don't know if others have. Well, and I just think, um, you know, clarifying information too, we had a pretty long presentation about the effects of vaping um, last meeting, and the information came from CDC and these peer reviewed journals that the information we received and that I continue to receive as a nurse is that vaping is uh, not a safe alternative to smoking. And, you know, Dr. Laco, as a physician, you know, I think that. While I can appreciate where you're coming from, and I appreciate the information about the flavoring because that helps our perspective as well. Mm -hmm. um, I personally do not have the the belief that vaping is safer. Why is the UK putting vape shops in hospitals if it's not a safer alternative? Why are thousands of people dying due to vaping-related lung injuries in the United States? Black market tobacco or THC cartridges and it illegal, could be. illicit. And black market be. THC cartridges. The CDC has already said that. Both the CDC and the FDA have already put that out there. It has nothing to do, I've been vaping for six years. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Standing here just fine. I do think there needs to be more research done because there's this um, vitamin E acetate that has been found in, in the- Vitamin E acetate oil will not work with with I vegetable think. glycerin and propylene glycol. These, this is water soluble. They, they don't Vitamin know. Vitamin E acetate the, is not. They don't know if that's the only chemical causing because there's a lot of chemicals. No, that's, I'm pretty sure they said it was. No, they, <laughs> you got to read it as they need to do more research because they're finding it in the bronchoscopies of yep. patients that have been hospitalized. But that doesn't mean that's the only chemical causing the injury. How long have they been looking for it? It's only been a short while. I feel so, like they work a lot quicker when it comes to any other products that they find problems with. It, it takes time because we have a small proportion of So to there's an estimated 13 million vapors in this country. How many lung cases have we had? A thousand? 
People have been using these products for 10 plus years in this country. It's I feel like we'd have a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. It's just not being reported. Some of them, that they actually took the patients that haven't been hospitalized and had lung injury off the cases. So it actually looked like it dropped. But there's, there's lots of cases in the US um, that are not being reported. How do you know if they're not being reported? Well, they're being reported, but they're not counting them in um, the case patients. I just read it. Do we have those statistics? How many are those? Not yet. OK. They're still compiling All right. it. Yep. This is a contentious, t contentious topic, and I know even having the bylaws in front of me reminds me as a board what we're here for, which is you know conditions in which people can be healthy. and so. Yes. That's why we talk about these things. And People quitting cigarettes is conditions that they can be healthy. Absolutely, 100%. They kill 1,300 people a day in this country. Cigarettes. Where's yep. the cigarette ban? Can we talk about banning cigarettes maybe in Fargo? That would be very no? nice. Yeah, <laughs> no? Yeah, can't do it, can you? No way. That would be very nice. Mm -hmm. so, any other comments that you would like to, no, to I'm offer good. at this point? Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Thank you. Any other? OK, perfect. I'm Darius. I'm also a shop owner. Um, let me start by saying that actually just yesterday I met with Desi and Larry um, at, at uh, Desi's office and I am also passionate about this. I've had a store for six years. Um, I also have kids myself as well. Um, you know when it comes to protecting our, our goal here by by doing a flavor ban and raising the age 21 is to protect, protect the kids, right? So who who's protecting my kids? You know what about the what about the 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 kids that have grandparents and parents that have used these products and these devices to quit smoking cigarettes. What about the kids that have parents and grandparents that that are employed by this industry that use this to provide a means for them? Who's protecting them? I get a cricket, right? You know, my, my other concern is that the kids that are getting their hands on these devices and that are using them, that's a criminal act. Okay, they are committing a criminal act. It is illegal to possess that. And we are, we are more worried about protecting them than we are the other 13 million Americans that use these products to quit smoking cigarettes. Nobody's worried about those kids. You know, and, and, and let me just start by saying, when, when we talk about the lung diseases, ma'am, you made the comment, 56% of the people that have had these lung diseases have used a black market THC cartridge called Dank Vapes. It's an underground marijuana company that's making these cartridges. The vitamin E acetate is being used as a thickening agent in these. I've had a store for six years. When was the first reported illness here in North Dakota? Can anybody say it? Probably just recently, right? I've had a store for six years now selling nicotine products. Okay. And also, when, when it talks, when, when we talk about the youth being attracted to the flavors, just last week the National Youth Tobacco Survey came out from the CDC. Fifty-six percent of the kids that ha that were surveyed in this said it was curiosity that made them use a vape, not a flavor. Actually, the second most common one was because they had a peer or a family member that used that. Flavors was third. Was third. Nobody wants to talk about this. Everything you guys are hearing is is one-sided. Okay, our FDA commissioner made a comment, made a quote. Our former FDA commissioner, Gottlieb, said, if every single person in America were to switch to a vape that was smoking cigarettes, that would be a huge win for public health. That comes straight from our FDA. Also, one thing that's not being said as well is patients who have gotten this lung disease, more than half of those originally lied about using marijuana cartridges. They originally just said they just used nicotine products because trying to get health insurance coverage for using an illegal marijuana product and also potentially facing, facing a criminal charge for that is going to be pretty strenuous for them. So they originally lied about what they used. Nobody talks about that as well. So I, I'm, I'm open to any questions, but just like him, I'm very passionate about this. You know, I, I support a, a Tobacco 21. I, I okay. support it more federally so that it doesn't affect businesses and then, you know, it's you know, if we do it in Fargo, just go right across the river, bring them over here, it would be really tough for law enforcement to, to, to enforce that because technically it would not be illegal for them to possess it here. A 19-year-old can still possess it because they could buy it in a legal city and bring it over here. So we're, in the next six months, I told Mr. Anderson this yesterday, we're going to be 21 federally, it sounds like, anyways. You know, I do not support a flavor ban. I will support a Tobacco 21. No, no vape shop owner will support a flavor ban. Tobacco 21, yes. I'd rather have it done county-wise, state-wise, federal-wise than just one city because we're still going to have the same problems. We're still going to have the same problems. They're going to get these no matter what. I actually, I felt that I gave Mr. Anderson and Desi some, some good things that we could do to try to keep these out of the hands of kids because I don't want them in the hands of kids anymore than anybody else. I have an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old daughter. 
my 14 year old is going to be a freshman next year. I don't want her seeing her friends with these. I don't want her having these as well. But, you know, it, it, it really frustrates me when I, when I see people laugh about, like, I've had a store for six years. I've, I've passed every single compliance check. Okay, I sell these products to adults. 90% plus of what I sell are flavored products. Okay, if anybody thinks these are only attracted to kids, I'll pay you to come work a shift in my store. And you can see the adults, the, the, the probably 25 years old plus is probably my age range as well. And you will see a 70 year old lady who wants a green apple flavor. Anybody that disagrees with that is 100% false and I can prove it by coming over to my store. Thank you, Darius. I'm open to any questions if anybody wants to ask. Questions for Darius? His point about the possession mm -hmm. begs the point, does that need to be part of any ordinance we consider that possession would also be? Yeah, I think we'd have to look at the the possession well, piece like marijuana it's a controlled substance so you cannot bring those across state lines through states because it's a federal controlled substance this is not so if Fargo goes to 21 they could go to Moorhead it's just going to have to be regulated on the retail end you know an officer is <laughs> not going to say okay you're 19 where did you buy this from oh you bought it in Fargo here's your site you bought it in Moorhead you're legal so it makes a lot of work for law enforcement as well in the next six months our entire country will be 21 it sounds like Trump's going to do it. It sounds like, you know, everybody supports that. So I do support that at a federal level, personally, yeah. Okay. I think that was one of the one of the things on even the devil's like ordinance. There's some things related to possession that they still need to, to work out and address. So that will be an important component of that. I think, you know, at the, the federal level, certainly that would be ideal. Um, I think there's probably gaps in that federal legislation as well so I would like to see us move forward with something that's make sh to make sure that we have what works here mm -hmm. in North Dakota in particular and in, in, in the county as well so but it, it's coming um, all around so I appreciate your comments on both of the topics and certainly we'll we'll have more discussion probably on the flavor issue but let's see where the tobacco 21 goes thank you thank you any other public comments? Hello there. My name is Brian Reek. I uh, am a company director with Infinite Vapor. We actually have a store here in Fargo, one out in Bismarck, uh, one in Minot, and up in Grand Forks. So, you know, what we like to call the four corners of this great state of North Dakota. Um, my fellow colleagues here, I think, have you know done an excellent job of kind of laying out some really key points and. Um, you know, in terms of the Tobacco 21 ordinance, I again come from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, obviously, uh, in the state of Minnesota, a key leader in terms of legislation. And uh, I think we've had a Tobacco 21 ordinance since the end of the year of 2017. I believe October 1st it was. Um, and, and quite honestly, it's been nothing but a, a positive thing for us outside of refusing a few more sales to now underage individuals. Um, we think it is a really beneficial thing in terms of eliminating um, one more step in terms of accessibility for youth. Um, I myself, you know, came from that situation where I was 18 years old and um, it, I made that decision to start utilizing tobacco products and it was certainly not long before a 17-year-old friend of mine asked me, hey, by the way. Um, so those things I, I believe will still exist, but in terms of an actual flavor ban, I know one of the biggest questions everyone's been asking is, you know, how many adults realistically use a flavored product to quit using traditional uh, combustible tobacco products. And uh, according to a 2006 uh, Consumer Advocates for Smoke-Free Alternatives uh, report, they surveyed over 37,000 um, adult uh, vapors, and of those, uh, just over 72% reported utilizing flavored products to help them with their transition and make the switch. So um, I know and understand you all have, uh, you know, talked about, uh, you know, relooking at some more statistics here, but uh, as well a Heartland Institute uh, examined the effects of an actual flavor ban that took place in Santa Clara, California. Um, and this is in uh, uh, age-restricted stores uh, specifically uh, back in 2014. Um, after that ban, 2015-2016, youth use of products was at 7.5%. Uh, and the following year or period of 2017 to 2018, it had actually risen to 10.7%. So even after following a flavor ban in age-restricted stores, uh, the youth rate actually increased over that period of time. So 
Um, certainly all important things for you to consider, um, and I do appreciate your time, and if you have any questions for me, please let me know. Thank you for the information. Yes. I know that we're Thank past you. our normal time, so but welcome um, to have any um, further discussion on flavors at the, the next meeting as well. So any other items that we need to discuss today, Desi, or others? No, just our next meeting date. Okay, next meeting is February 14th, Valentine's <laughs> Day. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for the, for the great discussion and keep everybody updated on the Tobacco 21 effort, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.